So this is joint work with uh, Daria Kurilova from CMU and Laurie who's sitting over there. Um, the motivation for this talk is as follows. So I've been working on uh, um, a JIT compiler for Python for a number of years. It's called PyPy and it works really well. So you give it your Python program and it makes your Python program run much faster and great. Except that there, I mean, there are various sets of programs where that's not, it doesn't work that well. And an interesting set of programs is one where the Python program actually uses a database to, to store its data and uses uh, SQL to get at that data while, while the Python uh, program is running. So here's an example, just a very small one. You, you have some kind of connection to your database and you just tell the database to execute some SQL query, which is really simple here. Just uh, select a few, a few uh, columns and return the value of these columns. And then you have some Python code down here. And what the Python code does is it iterates over the result of that query. So um, all of the three rows uh, end up being local variables here, and then you do some, some kind of Python computation here. And um, so now the JIT doesn't really have a chance, right? Because um, the JIT is really good at optimizing the code down here, which is just a little bit of simple arithmetic. But to the JIT, it's uh, completely, I mean, a sizable amount of time in this program is spent running the SQL query here. And since we only have a Python JIT, we can't really win because the Python JIT, of, of course, doesn't know what's happening in the database, and um, thus it can't optimize what's happening in the SQL query, and it also can't optimize the fact that between the data being returned from the database and the Python code, um, there are a number of conversion routines that take the SQL values and turn them into Python values. And again, the, um, the Python JIT doesn't really have a chance to do something with it because it doesn't see it. Uh, right, so what we wanted to do is um, think of ways to improve the situation. And the first thing we did was make the problem simpler. Because if you have a real database, then um, the database is sitting on some far off server and there is a network connection in between and, and networks are annoying and more than one computer is annoying. So we simplified the problem and said, okay, can we at least improve the situation if we have an embedded database that's running right inside our process? So in theory, things got simpler, the database is a lot closer, can we do something now? And we decided to do a little, uh, like an experiment with a, a database called SQLite, which is uh, the most commonly used embedded database. And um, SQLite is, is quite typically like combined with some kind of language, often a dynamic language. So you have your dynamic language application that needs to store some data. It's, it uses SQLite to do that storage. And every time it needs to get its edit data, it uses SQL statements to extract, uh, extract stuff, stuff out of that. And as I already said in, in the code example, getting the data across that boundary can be quite slow. So can we somehow, it would be cool if we could teach the JIT that we have for Python, if we could teach that somehow to, to, to interact with a JIT for uh, SQLite, right? A JIT that, a hypothetical JIT that um, speeds up SQL uh, execution. And so if we had these two JITs and we could make them talk to each other, can we somehow achieve it that yeah, that, that, that yields uh, good performance and, and like a much nicer story, right? So um, the prototype that I'm going to uh, talk to you about, about today is called SQPyte, and it is indeed this kind of combined Python SQLite uh, jitting system. Okay, right, um, as I already said, SQLite is, is a small embedded database. It's, it's beautiful C code, it's very readable. They have the most intense testing regime of any project I know. Uh, it's, it's really, it's quite, quite a nice project. Uh, it's also really, really widely used. I, I bet there are probably hundreds of instances of SQLite running in this room right now. I mean, it's, it's basically, it runs on every OS. Every OS ships it. Uh, so all the desktop operating system, all the mobile operating systems, uh, Firefox has one embedded. I'm sure some other browsers do too. So it's really, it's really very successful, widely used. Nice, nice product. Uh, it also has an interesting property that it's dynamically typed, right? So um, uh, the columns of the database have a type, type attached, but the application is, is perfectly, uh, can perfectly happily ignore those types. So you can just store um, an, an integer into a, a column that, that's type float, and the database will happily do that for you, uh, and things will work. Right. Anyway, uh, that matches quite well the fact that Python is also, so, so there's no problem there. Right, so um, the JIT that I've been talking, uh, telling you about in the motivation is called PyPy. Um, it's a sort of long running pro, uh, program that, uh, project that tries to improve the execution speed of Python programs. 
And um, the, the reason why it's named PyPy is because um, uh, it's a Python implementation that is itself written in Python. And it's not written in the full uh, power of the language. Instead, it's written in a small subset of the language that is called RPython. And RPython is uh, a subset of Python that's chosen in such a way that you can take RPython programs and bootstrap them into C programs. I mean, you do type inference, and then you just, uh, on, on the RPython program, and then you compile the thing to C. Okay, that's pretty boring. It's just it's just a bad version of Python that, that you can type inf inference, do type inference on. But it also has a, a, a cool extra feature, which is the, called the, the RPython just-in-time compilation framework. And what that does is, if you write an interpreter for a language in RPython, then during the process to turn that RPython interpreter into a C-based interpreter, you can also automatically insert an extra component, which is uh, a tracing JIT compiler for that language um, that you have written an interpreter for. Right, so, so PyPy is using this framework to get its JIT compiler for, uh, for the Python language. Um, but this process is completely generic, right? Given any interpreter uh, for any language in, written in R Python, with a few extra annotations on the interpreter, you can get a tracing JIT compiler inserted into that uh, interpreter for you. So, like, it's, it's quite automatic, as I said, a few annotations are needed. Uh, if you want to know more about that part, there is a summer school tomorrow where a um, little advertisement block uh, where I ask the attendants to do that for a small language. Right, okay, so the idea of SQPyte is that we want to do just that for, for SQL execution, right? Okay, but uh, let, let, let's, let's take a step back. Um, so we have PyPy. What PyPy does is it's executing Python code using the R Python interpreter for Python. And as, as, as long as there's really only Python code involved, things are nice and happy. We have, um, we have some kind of loop here that's executing some Python code. It's, it's operating on Python data structures. And the tracing JIT will easily recognize that this is an important loop. It will trace the loop, and it will turn it into a very efficient machine code. Great. However, if we run the program that we've seen before, this one, uh, then the situ situation isn't really that happy anymore. Because while the JIT traces this stuff down here fine, it, it sees uh, the iterator here, which asks the database for the next for the next row in the database, right? And then it hits, the tracer hits that boundary. It hits a call to a shared library that's written in C, and um, the JIT cannot actually like look into the, the assembly code of that shared library, right? So that's bad. So um, what do we do? So the first thing, it would be cool to know how SQLite actually works, which we did when we started. So you open the files, and it's, it's actually, as I said, it's very nice C code, so it's very readable. And it turns out that SQLite itself is also um, just, just an interpreter, like as you might have guessed. So it's, um, it's also a bytecode interpreter. It has a, a, regist a register machine architecture. And a lot of the bytecodes are very much like what you would expect, right? So you have a bytecode to add to registers, you have a bytecode to load constant integers, you have a bytecode to do conditional jumps, and and all that kind of sort of typical bytecode-y stuff that you like, you know, bytecode for calls and, and all these kind of things. And then, of course, in addition to those sort of very standard language bytecodes, you also have more database-oriented um, bytecode instructions, like give me the next row uh, of the database, do an index-based search for a value that is in that range, um, and, and, and these kind of bytecodes are, that are quite different than what a typical language implementation needs. Oops, that's not good. I'm going to ignore it. Um, right, so this is, this is the, the interpreter side of SQL, uh, of SQLite. But then on the other hand, there, there's really a lot more sort of support infrastructure that you would, um, that you would sort of expect to find if you, if you think about what, what a database does. So obviously, um, there are a lot of, like all the data is stored in B trees in, in, order, in order to be able to find things quickly. So there are a lot of sort of the traditional B tree algorithms implemented in C code. There's also a lot of uh, support code to deal with annoying things like files and file locking and different operating systems and, and being careful against uh, strange things happening to your file, somebody moving it away or whatever. Um, and and Clearly, all those kind of things over here that I just call algorithms here uh, are just, it's, it's perfectly fine that they're in C, right? 
So uh, obviously a JIT is not going to make better code for the traditional B tree algorithms because a B tree algorithm really doesn't have any kind of dynamic behavior. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense to, to to do anything about those, right? So, but the thing that where it makes sense to do something is all the more traditional interpreter stuff, right? I mean, all we all know that if you want to implement a fast language, you're, you're not using an interpreter because uh, interpreter have problems like bytecode dispatch overhead and everything slow and um, right. So if you want a fast language, then maybe you, you don't want an interpreter. So we know that for languages, what we don't know. Uh, is whether the same is true for for uh, executing SVL code, right? So what we did is we said, okay, we have the C-based interpreter. We we have a tracing JIT that works on our Python interpreter, so we we can't continue here. So what we did was we replaced the C the C-based interpreter. We rewrote that in a sort of a little bit annoying but not too hard manual pro pr progress uh, process, and we rewrote that into an R Python interpreter, and like this, right? So we we took the bytecode dispatch loop and then step by step we replaced every um, every bytecode implementation in C by an equivalent bytecode implementation in R Python. And um, as I said that it's not very hard. It's it's a little bit tedious and it's a little bit annoying to debug because it's C, but um, sort of there, there's nothing there's nothing fundamentally interesting here. And just a very small example. This is the return bytecode. What the return bytecode does is it reads a, a register, which the registers are in this amem data structure. And it reads a register that is specified by the first argument of the opcode. And it, it makes sure that that register, store, register stores an integer. And then it, it sets the program counter to be the value of that register. Right? And then it sets the flags of the uh, register to undefined to make sure that uh, you notice if you're trying to use it again. Right, so that's just, it basically jumps to some kind of linked register. So we took that and as I said, it's a bit annoying but not hard. We transliterated that to our Python. And by doing so, we introduced a little bit of abstraction but not too much. So basically, um, accessing the register file up there is not done via just an array, but there is some kind of method call that gives you the register. And um, also reading the flags is not just reading a struct field. Instead, it's, again, there's, it, there's a little bit, bit of abstraction but nothing fundamentally hard. Right, so after we went and implemented um, a lot of the bytecodes of uh, SQLite in our Python, we got, we, we're back to this kind of system. And now now the world's beautiful, because now the, the tracer the, the, the tracer of our Python can do its job properly. Um, when the tracer, while tracing Python code, encounters a call to the SQLite database, it doesn't have to stop, because now uh, the SQL, SQLite database is not in C anymore. It's itself an R Python interpreter, so it can just keep tracing. And so the first thing that happens is it can keep tracing across the boundary between Python code and SQL code. So it will happily inline um, the behavior of the SQL code on the other side into the machine code that it was generating for the consuming loop on the Python side. So um, so yes, you, you get a loop that... that um, crosses the two, the two boundaries and, and contains a lot of the execution of the SQL code as well. And there's still a boundary, but it's much further back. And that boundary is actually um, at the point where you really hit the B tree algorithms, right? Because as I said earlier, it doesn't really make sense to, to dip them. There's no dynamicity, dynamicity there. So instead, when, you, when, when we hit the boundary of the B tree algorithms, we just um, insert calls to those C-based algorithms into the generated machine code that the JIT makes. Um, but that still gives us a lot. Um, it, it still uh, makes sure that all the overhead of the bytecode interpreter of SQLite is completely removed, and all that is left is, is the right sequence of, of calls into um, the more low-level routines of, of the database. Right, uh, so this is the nice idealized picture. Mm. What happens in practice is that things are a little bit more complicated because uh, in the end it was too annoying to really port all the bytecodes and there are a lot of bytecodes that aren't really very performance oriented. I mean, you open the table once so there's no, there is no need to put a lot of effort into making opening a table really fast, right? So uh, also we decided not to optimize writing into the database too much. I mean, it's still kind of okay, but writing is not that optimized. 
uh, but focus on reading instead. So the, the boundary is a little bit more jagged, right? We, we left more stuff in C, and and um, if we hit if we hit such a bytecode that we didn't optimize too well, we just leave a call to the C implementation, which is still at, at least it's, it's it's never going to be worse than what SQLite does. Uh, another thing is that so far I always talked about there's just there's just this one loop that comes from Python and then goes into SQLite and back, but of course that's also much more complicated in practice. I mean. Let's draw some squiggles. I mean, the first thing is that quite often you, you're not just having an SQL statement that gives you the whole database. You, you will have some where clause or something. And if you have a where clause, what happens is that there's kind of an inner loop in SQL which goes over rows until you find a row where the where clause is, all the where clauses match. And only then you sort of do an iteration of the outer loop, which will go back to Python and, and run the Python code that consumes it, and then goes back into the database, which into the inner loop to find the next row that matches. So that's that's the little that's the little squiggle here, and then um, and then you can also cross the boundaries back and forth more often than just once per sort of Python code iteration because SQLite allows you to define new SQL function and new S SQL aggregation functions in Python, and if you hit one of these during execution, you will sort of call back from the SQL execution back into Python, return the result which is used by the rest of the SQL execution, and then only later we turn the full result back to Python, right? Um, so what, what kind of optimizers, optimizations do we get by this process? The most important one is we, will, we inline machine code that is generated for the SQL execution into the machine code that is generated for the Python execution, and we are able, while doing that, we are able to optimize away, completely away, the type conversions that are necessary to turn uh, SQL-based values into Python-based values um, that, that come out of the database into Python-based values that are needed to be continue execution on the Python side. So th those are the two important ones. And then, then there's the third one um, that is, as I said earlier, uh, SQLite is dynamically typed. So one could also think that, oh great, we have a JIT, it's great at removing the effects of dynamic typing. So since SQL, SQLite is dynamically typed, we might be able to win something uh, along those lines as well. Right, so um, following from these optimizations, we have uh, two hypotheses. Actually, there's a third one, but I'm not going to have time uh, to go into that. So the first hypothesis is if, you have, if you're able to optimize crossing the boundary between a programming language and an embedded database, you're going to significantly reduce the execution time of uh, Python code that runs SQLite queries. The second hypothesis is I mean, as a side effect of doing this kind of thing, we also have a JIT purely for SQL execution. So one could think that maybe we also speed up pure SQL queries that don't involve a lot of Python code um, on themselves. So the first, second hypothesis is, okay, does that actually help purely SQLite as a database? Okay, so to address the first hypothesis, we, we wrote a number of Python benchmarks um, that, that uh, micro benchmarks that just are small Python programs that uh, run a query and then consume the consume the results and all the queries are rather small. I'm I'm not go, going into too much detail. And what you see here is basically the um, speed up that SQPyte, uh, which is the JIT implementation that is able to inline across the language layers, uh, into SQLite. And um, you see that depending on the benchmark, there are speed ups between 60% faster and and all, almost six times faster. And the, the mean of the speed ups is, is about three times. So that's nice, right? So hypothesis one is looking pretty good here. Um, and to, to look into hypothesis two, what we did is take the TPCH benchmark set, which is sort of a widely used uh, database benchmark set, and, and compare that between SQPy and SQLite. In these, there is not actually any Python code running, because all these queries take sort of a long time, or longish time. Um, and then there's not, not, not really any Python, there, there are not a lot of results and there's not really any Python code that, that looks into them. And for them, our results are not that nice. Uh, I mean, we still are able to like speed up thing, one query by 25% and like, this one by 13 and, and here's one that slows down by two, but it's actually just because the, the query runs for like, I don't know, 20 milliseconds or something like that. So um, that's a little bit of a weird benchmark. But even the average, uh, the mean of, of all the speedups does not, it's not really significant. So the, the error includes one, so we cannot really conclude that we're winning here, right? Uh, okay, um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip this part. 
So, um, in summary, uh, we managed to write a prototype of a system that is able to uh, optimize across the language and database boundary um, and can give very good uh, performance improvement if you have queries that cross the boundaries between the two often. Um, if, you, if all your execution time is on the Python side, you don't need to do anything because the JIT is already helping you. And if everything's on the SQL side, then our JIT might still help a little bit, but probably not as much as if you cross a lot. Um, and a, a, cool, a, a cool property of the approach we took was that we, we managed to re, reuse significant uh, portions of the SQLite code, uh, code base. A lot of those that are very annoying to write and, and, and debug, like all, all these pesky um, B-tree manipulations. Right, and um, there, are, there are various directions that we imagine that, we, that one could go into, but in the interest of time, I'm going to be done here. Thank you. So for the hypothesis two, um, the numbers you showed us was not big, but do you expect if you spend more time and tune it, it might be go up or somehow you have already hit some more? Okay, so I already disconnected, but I mean, so I think there are two directions to take things. You could try to do less work. Like, can you, can you, can you win by doing a lot less? And then you would win even less on, on the pure SQL queries. Or you could try to uh, do more work by um, basically integrating the JIT much deeper into the SQLite runtime. Because right now, there were still a lot of data structures of SQLite that we basically didn't touch. And they are a little bit of a problem because um, if the JIT sees a C data structure, it, it cannot do as nice, I mean, the, the optimizations it can do on those are not as powerful as on sort of managed data structures, right? So I think if somebody uh, wanted to and would put uh, some more amount of effort into it, uh, might, one might replace all these C-based data structures by our Python data structures and get some more winnings. But I mean, it turned out that uh, during this project, it turned out that a lot of my intuitions about uh, what optimizations I expected to help were really wrong. So um, I'm not really that prepared to make a lot of speculations because I mean, a lot of things that I put a lot of effort into and thought that would help didn't. So, um, right. Okay, so this is really cool work. I, I love I love to see more of like these these kind of things on the uh, boundary between programming language and, and databases. So, I think I have just one thing I would probably disagree with. So I think you said like two times that um, it's not a good idea to jit the internal like B tree data structures and right. these kind of things. And so in our experience, this actually got us a factor of like four x uh, speed ups by actually specializing data structures and specializing traversal code. And uh, I, I agree, I agree, if you are really able to change the internal representation of the data fundamentally, I completely agree, but sort of one of the design constraints that we gave ourselves is that we still want it to be completely compatible with SQLite. Right, but like for example, if you're implementing a hash join, then there's no reason why you right. can't generate your own hash tables. Yes. Yeah, I already disconnected, otherwise I could have shown you the numbers. But it turns out that the, so we did various experiments trying to isolate which of the optimizations actually helps. And the, the, the thing that, that really helps is the fact that you, that if, if you stop the inliner from going across the layers and stop optimizing off the conversions, then you lose most of the performance effects. So it's really the case that what costs you in this tight integration is the fact that you sort of, in costly ways, need to uh, turn SQL data into Python data and back. And yeah, so I think that, and, and indeed, maybe there are ways to do that in a much more lightweight way without having to do all this JIT stuff, right? I mean, so, okay. <laughs>